the answer in short is there is not in any practical sense, a way to feed your dog too much protein. It is conceptually possible, but the number is absolutely massive. And so the reason that it's conceptually possible is that protein is not the only essential nutrient for a dog. They have to take in all kinds of different vitamins to some degree to avoid deficiency disease. They also have to take in a certain amount of fat on a regular basis in order to prevent the development of other deficiency diseases. And the only way you can feed your dog too much protein is if you feed it so much that it's not getting the amount of fat that it needs. And what that means is basically if you go above like 80% of the diet being protein, and so you're talking about like lean chicken breast only tire diet, like something like that, Mm -hmm. you could run the risk of having your dog develop a deficiency disease from not getting enough fat. But otherwise, the amount of fat that's required doesn't come into play if you're talking about feeding your dog something like is natural for a wolf or is common if dogs are left to their own devices. Something like 50% of the calories from protein, that doesn't run up against that, that concern about the amount of fat that's in the product at all. But that's not even like when you talk to folks who have a, a little bit of an idea, they've heard something, it triggers something when they think about too much protein. What you tend to hear instead is people will say, well, isn't it true that too much protein can damage my dog's kidneys? That's kind of the thing. Kidneys are involved in protein metabolism. And, you know, as you, they're, they're basically involved in, uh, in processing protein that comes in. And so at one point in the development of nutritional science, folks in the veterinary domain believed that, well, if I've got a dog that has kidney problems, that has some kind of renal disease, renal is like kidney. If, if I've got a dog with renal disease, I don't want to give it very much protein. It makes, it's a good theory. It's a good idea. I don't want to give it very, we probably shouldn't give it much protein because we don't want to tax that organ that's right. not functioning so well in the first place, which is a pretty plausible sounding theory, pretty reasonable sounding theory. And it has become a source of like dogma in the veterinary nutrition community where folks will say, if your dog has kidney disease, you have to cut back on the amount of protein because kidneys are used to process the protein and you don't want to tax that organ. But it's even been extended even further than that where some people say have developed the notion that my dog's kidneys are perfectly healthy, but I want to make sure they stay that way. So I don't want to feed it to, I don't want to feed it a high protein diet because it's going to tax those kidneys is going to lead to kidney disease over the long term. The reality, and it's been documented like very thoroughly is that neither of those theories hold water. Those are nutritional myths that continue to persist it to some degree or another in the conventional wisdom but they've been tested experimentally numerous times and there is absolutely no basis for them. And you can read, there's this fantastic, it's not an actual study, but it's a, it's a piece that was published in the, in an academic journal that describes all the studies that have been done. It's what's called like a, a, a it's not really a meta analysis, but it's just like an evidence review. Somebody that this, this vet who used to, I believe the guy's passed away now, but a guy from the university of Pennsylvania wrote up an entire paper on is this fact or is this nutritional myth and is vehement that what the answer is, is it's nutritional myth. And he traces like where the theory came from, from studies on rats and how it made sense to test the theory. It sounds kind of plausible, but then it was tested very well tested and does not hold water. And like I said, the link is in the show notes. You can read it for yourself and you can see, I'm not exaggerating the, the like language that the guy uses is like completely unequivocal. Um, oh. That's great. I, as a non-scientific person, that sounds like something to just read through and the comparison of is yeah. a, is a fact and tracing it back. It's largely not technical language. Like if it, if you're just kind of, a, you, know um, you know, like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and there's not much math. So that's good too. But it's when you start, you know, the, the, the idea that, okay, kidneys equal protein processing, a lot of protein probably puts tax on the kidneys, they might not be able to handle it. That does sound like a reasonable, plausible theory that's worth testing. But when you take a step back and you go, wait a second, these animals, if A left, they've developed an instinct to take in half of their calories from protein. And we know that for 99.9% .9 of their evolutionary heritage, they took in about 50% of their calories from protein. The idea that giving your dog that much is going to damage its kidneys kind of starts to then it feels like less plausible a theory. Right. You know, you could see why that wouldn't be something that would make sense. Why would an animal develop instincts to take this stuff in? Why would it do that in its natural environment 
and yet that contributes to the development of a kidney disease in, in right. a real way. It kind of doesn't make sense when you think about it in that kind of way. So anyway, that's the issue. It is possible to summarize. It's possible to feed your dog so much protein that it's going to be bad for its health. It is incredibly unlikely in practice. You have to feed it 80% of its calories from protein, something like that. And it can't um, be done with just a normal feeding schedule. Nothing you can buy, no pet food, <laughs> no pet food that you can buy in any store in the country is going to be 80% protein. And where that gets us is kind of to the last point before we just try to summarize everything, which is that um, what, okay, we know that we know based on what we've talked about today, what the percentage of like protein uh, calories tends to be. Mm -hmm. And we know that what's reported on the bag is not percentage of calories. It's this as fed percentage and working from that to the percentage of calories involves math and it's hard and who knows. What if I just look for, if I'm hearing you correctly, Dan, it's like the amount of protein that has to be in there is pretty low. And the amount that a dog will tend to take in on it left to its own devices is like three times as much. Mm -hmm. So maybe I should just go look for what's called a high, a high protein diet. If I see on the bag, high protein, and it's got a wolf on the bag, and it's got an image of a something that could like a steak or a hamburger, or a chicken wing, something that contain, you, we all know contains a lot of protein. I'm just going to defer to that. It has to be right, right? It has yeah, all the exactly. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not. Uh, because the standard, the minimum is so low that you could feed twice as much of them as the minimum and still be closer to the minimum than the average amount that a dog would take in if left to its own devices and be one of the highest protein pet foods on the market today. But the amount that's often put in there is so low that like stuff that is marketed as high protein, there's not an official, it has to contain this many calories to be high protein, but it's it's just kind of a common sense like tests that, that, that brands tend to use. Like I said, you can do twice as much as is required and still be not even close to what is typical in, an, in a wild environment. And so just relying on something that's like, oh, this is a high protein diet. All that means is that it's somewhat higher than the like very bare minimum that is going to keep your dog from immediately beginning to develop a disease. So I, I do not think of that as being a particularly helpful heuristic. I know that's like kind of a $10 word, but heuristic means like a simple, like a, a way to reduce uh, the whole weird body of evidence that should be involved in making a decision into a couple of really clear steps. Like what's a good way to approximate all that stuff in a way that I can actually put to use when I'm in the store. I'm not going to bring my calculator. Right. To the store. I'm just, and so some people will just go, my heuristic is I'm going to look for a high protein diet and feed that. I would say that's not as good an idea as what you really should do is if you're going to feed a commercial product that you can buy at the store, and then when you flip it over, it's got a nutrition facts panel on the back of it. You want to feed the highest protein product that you can find. If you want to do what's most natural for a dog in both the sense that it would eat it if it's left to its own devices, and in the sense that it's what it's eaten throughout its entire genetic history, what you should essentially be doing is looking for the highest protein product you can buy in a store. Even then, it's not going to be as high as those two like good barometers of what measure good health. It's not going to be 52% of calories. It's going to be somewhat less than that. I'm trying to emphasize is that you're not going to find there is zero risk of finding something that contains so much protein that it's going to jeopardize your dog's health. There's no evidence that such a product is being sold in the United States today, period, full stop. That's not a thing. So really the best heuristic that I would encourage people to use is look for the highest number you can find. Feed the highest number you can find that's being sold in a commercial product. If you want to feed your dog the healthiest amount of protein, that's basically basically what you should do.